All right, thanks very much, Rong, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It's uh, really uh, a pleasure to speak in this seminar. I'm very happy to be here. So today I'd like to say a few words about an approach to singular moduli, which are special values of the J function at CM points, but in the setting of real quadratic fields. And so everything I'll say, to say today is uh, joint work with Henri Darmont. So if you don't know who he is, this is him. And so I'd like to start by first recalling the classical story briefly, um, the classical CM theory and the role that the J function plays there, before moving on to the main order of business, which is um, the theory of what we call rigid meromorphic co-cycles. And then finally, I'd like to um, say a few words about recent progress towards connecting these invariants with periodic families of uh, modular forms. So let's start with the classical story of singular moduli, and let's begin with class field theory. So in class field theory, we know we have a very nice way to understand the absolute Galois group of a number field, or rather it's abelianization, in terms of data that's entirely intrinsic to the base number field K, so in terms of its Adele class group, uh, more specifically, we have uh, what's called a global Artin map, which will define on profinite completions an isomorphism between the Siddell class group and the abelianization of the absolute Galois group. And it's a fantastic theorem that allows us to understand uh, both sides a little bit better through this isomorphism, but it does suffer from one crucial flaw. And that crucial flaw is that if I give you a finite index open subgroup of the Siddell class group, it's very hard to return the finite abelian extension of that number field that corresponds to it. So this subject is known as explicit class field theory and remains uh, very difficult uh, today. Uh, of course, there are exceptions. So if the number field that we're interested in is um, of a very nice shape, such as, for instance, if it's just a field of rational numbers, then we do have an extremely satisfactory description uh, in the form of the following theorem due to Kronecker and Weber, which tells us that all finite abelian extensions of Q can in fact be generated by suitable combinations of special values of an analytic function. So in this case, the analytic function is the exponential function evaluated at 2 pi i times an argument in the base field z. Okay, of course, that's just a fancy way of saying roots of unity, but I'd like to phrase it in this way as special values of an analytic function, because that's the form uh, that will remain true uh, in the next case that we'll talk about. So there's also the case of imaginary quadratic fields, for instance, which we understand very well, and that's the subject of CM theory. And again, we have a description which is very similar to the theorem we had on the previous slide, uh, which tells us that, in fact, all finite abelian extensions can be generated, again, by special values of an analytic function. But we've now gone from this rather elementary exponential function to a much more mysterious uh, modular function, which is the J function, and has a Q expansion that uh, starts off like this. So it's essentially the only SL2Z invariant function on the upper half plane. OK, so you need a few other related functions. But with the J function itself, if you also adjoin the roots of unity, uh, you get pretty close to getting all the finite abelian extensions of K. All right, so here's, here's an example, uh, just for fun, uh, that was computed by Weber, as far as I know, just by hand. Um, so you get, for instance, the J, the J function evaluated at the square root of minus 14 gives you this very nice algebraic number, um, which uh, lives in a degree 4 extension of that field. And it's, in fact, it generates the Hilbert class field in this case of that particular imaginary quadratic field. OK. Great. So a very natural question at this point, and that's a question that, that Kronecker asked, um, and then later also Hilbert, um, is can we generalize this type of theorem to general number fields k? And if so, what are these analytic functions that we should be evaluating at arguments of the base field to get finite abelian extensions of our given number field k? And so this is known as Kronecker's Jugendtraum, or Hilbert's 12th problem. And Hilbert had the following to say about this. So he said the extension of Kronecker's theorem to the case where instead of just rational numbers or imaginary quadratic fields, we could choose any number field whatsoever, he says, seems to me of the greatest importance. And he says he regards this problem as one of the most profound and far-reaching in the theory of numbers and of functions. So if you're anything like me, you're completely intimidated by this quote, and you have no desire to work on this problem because it just seems much too hard. And so what I propose uh, today is to just focus on the smallest case that is still mysterious to us, and that is the case of real quadratic extensions of Q, and see um, how we go with that case. 
OK. All right, so for imaginary quadratic fields, we had the j function. What should we get for real quadratic fields? Well, oh, sorry. Before I get to that, uh, let me take stock of a few properties. Because you see, if, we, if we're going to try and generalize singular moduli to real quadratic fields, we don't just want to really generate abelian extensions. These singular moduli have a lot of really beautiful properties. So let's make a list of the, the core properties that we'd like to retain in these invariants. So first of all, that's the thing that I uh, talked about. So in this case, this particular example, we generated the Hilbert class field over this uh, imaginary quadratic field. And in general, you can generate bigger and bigger ring class fields uh, over such imaginary uh, extensions from values of the J function. So that's the generating abelian extensions aspect of these numbers. But there are many other nice features that these numbers have. So for instance, they have very interesting prime factorizations. So there's the following. Um, well, if you take this number, it's an algebraic number, and you take its norm all the way down to Q, uh, you get an integer. So they're algebraic integers. And in this case, you get this particular integer. And in general, there's a theorem of Gross and Zagier that tells you exactly which integer you'll get. And this will be prescribed by certain intersection numbers um, of, um, in this case, cycles on Shimura varieties, but they're just points on zero-dimensional quaternionic Shimura varieties. And then finally, again, uh, due to the work of Gross and Zagier, these quantities are very closely related to the first derivatives of certain analytic families of modular forms. In their case, they'll arise as a piadic, oh, sorry, an, a real analytic family rather of Hilbert Eisenstein series restricted to the diagonal. Okay, so that's where these invariants show up in their work. And so ideally, we'd like to retain some of these properties. Okay, so today I want to tell you how one might go about forming analogs for real quadratic fields. And hopefully, I can convince you um, that these seem to have very similar properties. Okay. All right, so let's begin. So the J function worked really well for imaginary quadratic fields. So it'd be a shame to just not use it. Um, can we use it for real quadratic fields also? Well, there's a very basic, very stupid issue with that approach in that the domain of the J function is the Poincaré upper half plane. Um, and so if we want to evaluate that arguments in the base field, the real quadratic field, we can't do that because these, these points in real quadratic fields, which henceforward I'll just <laughs> refer to as RM points, lie just outside of the domain of this function. So naively, we can't seem to uh, really get anywhere with this. And of course, the naive issue, the very basic issue, is that the prime infinity is split in K. So by definition, the prime infinity is tricky to work with for this class of fields. Okay? Uh, and an equally naive solution to this uh, naive issue is that, well, instead of the prime infinity, let's take a finite prime P that is not split in K, and let's take one that's inert in K. So there's, of course, many choices. Uh, for instance, if we would be interested in imaginary quadratic we have worked with H infinity, the usual upper half plane, there's also all these other finite primes we could have worked with. And for real quadratic fields, we're really forced to work with um, such a prime. And so the idea is to replace H infinity, the Poincaré upper half plane, by the Drinfeld analog of it, so the Piatic upper half plane, when P is an inert prime in this field. Okay, so there are many, many choices, roughly half of the primes. Okay, so the main idea, um, and we'll break this down into steps in what follows, is to replace H infinity by HP. And what we'll do is we'll construct explicit classes, cohomology classes, in the first group cohomology of this funny group SL2Z1 over P, with values in meromorphic functions, non-zero, on HP. Now, the key point is that if we have such a cohomology class, we can actually meaningfully evaluate it at an RM point, because that's not clear. If we have a function, we can evaluate. If we have a cohomology class that requires some explanation, which I'll give uh, in a few slides time. And so as an illustration, before I tell you anything more precise, I just want to give you an idea of the types of identities that we end up getting. Uh, because they're extremely concrete. They're in some sense even much more concrete than what you would get from the special value of a J function, in that we always get numbers that arise as infinite products, piadic products, um, that of a very elementary nature, like the one that you see here, uh, converging to some element that seems to lie in some extension of the base field. So here, for instance, in this particular example, we take an infinite product over this mysterious set sigma tau, which is all of the numbers in the SL2Z1 over 5 orbit of tau, where tau is the square root of 2. Okay? But not all of the numbers. We take this one condition, which is to say that the norm of this number, all of these are RM points, 
so we can meaningfully take the norm down to Q, that should be a negative number. Okay, so with that extra condition, we have this mysterious index set. This is going to be an infinite product, and as a five adic number, it seems to tend to this um, interesting looking algebraic number, which genuinely lies in a field extension. And, and so you don't have to prove that? No, th this one is conjectural. I mean, it's tantalizing in a way because it's completely explicit, but uh, it seems, seems to be quite hard to prove this directly. OK, so the whole setting will be the piatic upper half plane. It's a nice rigid analytic space, which on the level of CP points is just given by you take P1 CP and you take away the QP rational points. And you should think of it as a sort of a tubular neighborhood of the Bruja Titz tree, um, which is a P plus 1 regular tree like this. And my notation for the holomorphic functions on the piatic upper half plane will be O, and M will denote the meromorphic functions on the piatic upper half plane. So we'll endow these with the weight zero action given by this formula. And now we start looking for our analogs or, or our solution to uh, Kronecker's Jugendtraum in this particular case. And so let's think about what CM theory really did. Well, in CM theory, this function j of z was essentially the only function that was SL2z invariant on the upper half plane that we could have cooked up. Um, and so if we try the same naively in this piatic setting, we see that immediately we run into trouble because, of course, the topology has changed completely. And this group SL2z now does no longer act discreetly on HP. It has lots of accumulation points. So for instance, these kinds of matrices tend to the identity matrix. So that means that the orbits are, are horrible. They're not discrete in HP for this action of this group. So in particular, as a consequence, because we have all this accumulation, the only invariant meromorphic functions that we get on HP are just the constant functions. Okay, so we might think that's game over for this approach, because it doesn't look like there's anything interesting there, really. What we'll do is we'll make the situation a little bit worse first, and then we'll make it better uh, afterwards. And the way in which we'll make it worse is by, instead of SL2Z, considering an even bigger group that acts even less discreetly, which is the Haras group, SL2Z1 over P. Now, this group SL2Z1 over P is, is global in nature in that it embeds into SL2R, and it embeds into SL2QP. And it's dense in both of these factors. But in the product, it's actually discrete. So this kind of accumulation that we had on the previous slide, Archimedeanly, that would blow up. That would be very big. So that would avoid these kinds of situations. So in the product, it's discrete. And so this is sort of our stand-in for an adelic group. We're really only using information at two places at the same time. Okay? So infinity and p. This will come back in the construction later on. OK, so the situation was as follows. H0 gamma m star consisted only of constant functions. So there didn't seem to be anything interesting in that H0. But what if we shift up the degree of the cohomology by 1 and look instead at H1 uh, of this group gamma with values in meromorphic functions on HP? That's what we call rigid meromorphic co-cycles. Okay? So co-cycles that give us classes in this cohomology group. And so a very important question to ask at this stage is, how is this even interesting? And how is this relevant to the, the goal that we had at the beginning? In other words, if we have a co-cycle, how do you produce a value of a co-cycle at an RM point? That's not at all obvious. And so that's the key point of this construction, is that in fact, it's possible to attach a meaningful invariant, a meaningful value at an RM point to one of these co-cycles. And the way you do that is as follows. So suppose that we have a point in HP, which is an RM point. Right? So it's, it lies in a real quadratic field because it lies in HP. P had better be inert or ramified in that field. Now, this condition of being an RM point is completely characterized by the fact that the stabilizer in this group is infinite cyclic, and it's generated by some element, uh, which we'll call gamma tau. Uh, this is usually called the automorph. And there's a, there's a canonical choice of generator for this rank 1 subgroup. So now what we do is we define for any co-cycle, any rigid meromorphic co-cycle like this, the RM value, which is defined to be, well, it's a co-cycle. So you feed it a matrix, and we feed it this generator of the stabilizer. Out comes a meromorphic function. And that meromorphic function, we evaluate at tau. Okay. Gamma is the SL2 That's right. That's what this gamma is. So it's a Haras group from now on. Gamma is always that group. Yeah. Now, uh, OK, so the first maybe small miracle is that this is independent of the choice of co-cycle that you took in its class. So it's really something you can attach to a, a class in cohomology. 
But what's more miraculous is that, in fact, this value, this number that we get out, is independent of the choice of tau in its gamma orbit. So this very much behaves as if it was the value at an RM point of a gamma invariant function, which didn't exist, right? That's what we established. So it behaves very much like the RM values of a fictitious gamma invariant function uh, on HP. Okay. And so a very natural question at this point, now that we know that we can meaningfully evaluate rigid meromorphic co-cycles at RM points is, well, are there any interesting rigid meromorphic co-cycles at all? Maybe these things just don't exist, and even if they did exist, these RM values might just not be interesting at all. Two very fair questions. Um, so let's get into them uh, in some more detail and see what we get out. So let's try and construct some of these rigid meromorphic co-cycles. And before we do that, we'll take some um, inspiration from the classical theory of uniformization of Mumford curves, or rather of Jacobians. Yeah. So because of this stabilizer property, I guess you don't have an analog of this in the classical case. Exactly. So in the CM case, this H1, it doesn't seem to be the right setting. In the CM case, what you should be doing is really still just work with H0, but work with a Shimura curve and a Schottky group instead. So in fact, I'm just about to talk about that uh, right now. No, we haven't really looked at that H1 in the classical case. I mean, certainly this naive construction would just give you one because the, the stabilizers would just be torsion. And so in that sense, these invariants would all be uh, trivial and not be very interesting at all. OK, so in the classical theory of Mumford curve, so suppose that now gamma is no longer this horrible Ihara group, but it's a very nice Schottky group. So it's a finitely generated discrete subgroup of SL2QP that arises as one of these groups which with, with which you can uniformize a compact Mumford curve, which I'll call X gamma. So it's going to be isomorphic to the quotient of HP by this time this discrete group gamma. So what happens classically is you can understand the Jacobians, or rather the uniformizations of the Jacobians of these Mumford curves using the theory of theta functions. And so theta functions are constructed um, you choose a divisor, A minus B, and then you form this infinite product where the product ranges over elements of this group, which is now discrete. And you range uh, and you take the, 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 the expression Z minus gamma A over Z minus gamma B. So this is a very interesting, very appetizing looking function, and it's almost invariant under gamma. So if you try and naively plug in gamma, you'll see that you get the same function back times a constant. So it's invariant modulo scalars. So they don't quite descend to the, to the Mumford curve, but it's this failure of, of being gamma invariant that's precisely relevant to the uniformization of the Jacobians. So they describe this uniformization via the following diagram. So there's a lot of terms in this, so let's focus maybe on the middle row in this thing. So we have a short exact sequence of gamma modules, which is just Cp times goes to m times goes to m times over Cp times. If you take the long exact sequence in cohomology attached to that, you get this. What we did with this explicit expression is we constructed elements in this group. Okay? So they're invariant meromorphic functions, modulo scalars. So we have elements in here. And these things don't necessarily live to something that's genuinely gamma invariant. That'll give us a function on the quotient. And the obstruction to this lift existing is measured by uh, H1 gamma Cp times, which is this class is encoded by these constants that come out when you do these substitutions. Okay? All right, so inside of this sit the, the functions that are actually analytic. So for instance, if you take A and B to be in the same gamma orbit, what you'll end up getting out is an interesting analytic function. So these sit inside of this, uh, this sequence that we just uh, discussed. And again, here there's an obstruction to something lifting to a global uh, holomorphic function, which necessarily then has to be constant because we have a compact curve. And the obstruction lives in some multiplicative lattice inside of H1 gamma Cp times. So H1 gamma Cp times here will just be G copies of Cp times, where G is the genus of this curve. Okay? So if you take this, this torus and you quotient out by this multiplicative lattice, out comes the Jacobian of the curve. And this fits together very nicely in the diagram where you put the divisors of degree 0 on the curve and the principal divisors here via this divisor map going across. So that gives you very, a very nice description of the uniformization of the Jacobian. So of course, we don't have the luxury to be able to take the quotient of HP by gamma, because that's a horribly non-discrete group. And so what ends up happening is we do a very similar thing, but the degree of the cohomology is always shifted up by one. 
So what we do in our situation is we have this gamma SL2Z1 over P, a Haras group. We construct for any RM point in HP a certain theta co-cycle. So that's the analog of the theta functions that we had before, but they live in H1 now, not H0. And the way that they're defined, which I'll tell you in, on the next slide, is, is very similar to the definition we just had. It's a very explicit infinite product expansion that we do, and they converge to uh, co-cycles modulo scalars. What we then get is a diagram which is very similar to the diagram we had before. And again, we get a, a sort of description of the uniformization of the Jacobian of x naught of p through a diagram that looks very much like the previous one, but you'll see that the degrees have gone up by one. So here again, we get the middle row, which is just a long exact sequence attached to the, the quotient sequence of gamma modules. And we've constructed elements in here, and I'll tell you on the next slide how this construction goes. So this is where the elements theta tau lie. One thing to note is that this definition depends on a choice of RM points, so that'll come back uh, later. Okay, so these co-cycles are not necessarily rigid meromorphic co-cycles. That's what this space was. That's the name we gave to this. There's an obstruction to lifting, which this time lies in an H2 gamma CP times. Now, H2 gamma CP times is a very simple thing. There's a Meyer Viatoris argument that tells you that this is just H1 gamma 0p CP times. So a group that we understand classically very well. So likewise, we have the analytic ones inside of them. And these analytic ones don't necessarily lift. And the obstruction lies, again, in a multiplicative um, sublattice of that, of that uh, particular group. And if you take the quotient, you get the Jacobian of x naught of p twice, again, with this, well, not this time with this extra factor here, um, which I won't say much about. But it's, it's an analogous situation to the previous slide, except there's one very important difference. So we can't take the quotient of hp anymore by gamma. So there's no real geometric content here. We can only formally really take divisors of degree 0 on gamma orbits of Rm points in HP. Okay, so this quotient doesn't exist. And that's precisely what makes uh, proving some of these conjectures quite challenging, this lack of a geometric side to this. OK, great. So what are these theta taus? I didn't really tell you, right? And so this is really where this global nature of this group is going to come in in a crucial way. It's, again, an infinite product but it'll use information at two places at once. So the infinite product, it'll be a piadic product, but there'll be some condition that comes from, from uh, infinity. Um, so the theta tau, that was the most general co-cycle. I'm not going to tell you just for the purposes of exposition what the most general is, but I'll, I'll tell you this kind of index two uh, situation where we take theta tau or theta p tau. Let's call that theta tau plus. That one has a slightly simpler definition. Now what that is, is we want to take the product over the entire gamma orbit of tau. Of course, that's not discrete, so we're going to have lots of problems uh, with convergence if we do that naively. Uh, and we take this z minus w over z minus pw. So what will save us is an additional condition that comes from the prime infinity coming from the geodesic between w and its algebraic conjugate. So if we now look at h infinity, that's the Poincaré uh, upper half plane. And we have our Rm point w, which lies in the gamma orbit of tau. It has a unique algebraic conjugate, because it's an Rm point, uh, which we'll call w prime. And then we have a geodesic in the upper half plane between w prime and w, like this. Okay? So it's a semicircle, really. What we do now is, well, we have this gamma, right? It's a co-cycle. So we take this gamma, and gamma will map infinity, the cusp infinity, to some other cusp. So suppose that this is infinity, and this is gamma infinity. So what we do now is we take the geodesic between infinity and gamma infinity. And these geodesics will intersect in some way. So they have an intersection number, which will always be 0 if they don't intersect, or plus or minus 1. A lot of the times it's 0, and that'll cut this set, which is horribly non-discrete, to some actual discrete subset of HP. So we can form this quotient, and we can prove convergence. But this condition that we need to make this set discrete will depend on the input gamma, and is different for every gamma. Okay? So it's really a co-cycle. OK. So that's what these uh, theta taus are. The general theta tau has an extremely similar description. Sure. Well, I mean, I've chosen here the convention that we go from W prime to W. 
Yeah. Right, but I, so you've chosen already some embedding. Of oh yes, absolutely. We've embedded both uh, in the piadics and the and the, the complex numbers. Absolutely. Um, let's see if I can get this to work again. Asleep, oh something. really? I should have. have been. Let's see. Oh no, that's a Sorry. tech file. Should be. Uh... All right, let me just uh, compile it again. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so we have this explicit infinite product uh, where we use information, this is important, at two places at once. So p and infinity both play a role in this definition. Oh, oops, that's not good. Mm, yeah, this is going to be a bit clumsier, so I apologize for this. Hopefully, uh, you won't get too annoyed by this, but I'll try and scroll from now on. So this definition might seem a little bit awkward at first. The first time you see it, it feels a little bit cooked up. But in fact, what we show after is that so all of these classes are automatically parabolic. And in fact, all of the parabolic classes that are invariant modulo scalars must be linear combinations of these theta co-cycles. So they're in some sense the only things that you could have possibly defined. Okay. So that makes them seem perhaps a little bit more natural. Um, oops. Maybe, yeah. Uh, let's see. Thank you so much, Remy. That's great. That's so much better. <laughs> OK. So um, right. So we have these elements in H1 gamma m star mod CP star. So they're not rigid meromorphic cocycles. Right? We don't want this invariance modulo scalars. There's an obstruction to lifting these um, to genuine rigid meromorphic co-cycles, not just modulo scalars. And this obstruction, like I said, lies in H2 gamma CP star, which is just the same as H1 gamma 0 of P CP times. Now this obstruction, if you trace that through in the previous diagram that we had, now takes a geometric form. It's precisely the stark Hegner point that Henri defined um, about 20 years ago. So this is funny, right, because in the, in the theory of stark Hegner points, you want to construct interesting stark Hegner points that have maybe uh, infinite order or something. Whereas here, you want them to be trivial, because they're the obstructions for these co-cycles to lift to genuine rigid meromorphic co-cycles. So there's a trade-off really here between the two uh, going on. Now, if this obstruction happens to vanish, and we know that it lifts to a genuine rigid meromorphic co-cycle, this lift is essentially unique, because the ambiguity to lifting lies in this finite uh, group, which is H1 gamma CP star. So it's essentially a unique lift if the obstruction vanishes. OK, so that's what these objects uh, look like. So this is not really important for what I'm going to say after, but I'd just like to mention where the motivation comes from, because it might seem like a strange object. This motivation comes from um, the work of Duke Imamoglu and Toth, um, which was really considering a slightly, well, a very different situation. Uh, what they were doing is they were looking at the space SL2R quotient R by SL2Z, regarded as a threefold. And that threefold happens to be diffeomorphic to a three sphere with a not removed. This is a classical fact that I don't know who it goes back to, but it was certainly known to Milner a long time ago. Now, what you can do is if you have a hyperbolic matrix in SL2R, you can follow what's called the diagonal geodesic flow inside of this threefold. And what you get is a loop that closes up. That's the hyperbolicity of this matrix that'll give you that. So we get an associated knot to every hyperbolic matrix inside of this threefold with uh, a trefoil knot removed. So a very natural question to ask is, well, if I have a knot coming from a hyperbolic matrix and I take its linking number with this trefoil, what do I get? And so that question, I think, was posed and also answered uh, by Etienne Guis who related this number, this integer that you get, to the Dedekind symbol. And the Dedekind symbol is, a, is something that shows up in the transformation law of the log of Ramanujan's delta function. It's this, it, the transformation law is exactly what you expect, but there's this correction factor, this extra integer, which is the Dedekind symbol. So it's related to that. Now, what Duki, Mamolu, and Toth did is they said, well, forget about this trefoil knot. If I just fill it in, say, naively, and I take two knots attached to two different hyperbolic matrices, what is their linking number? 
And what they observed is that this linking number is related to a certain rational co-cycle. Um, so it's a, it's a class in H1, really, of SL2Z uh, with values in meromorphic functions on P1 of C. And so this, th there turns out to be uh, uh, quite a, an extensive literature on these objects. So it's related to work of uh, Marvin Knopp and Yungju Choye and uh, Don Zagie and many other people. So these people have considered these co-cycles. Um, SL2Z, yeah, that's right. Uh, that's true, so let me think about this. Um, but you can, yeah. Yeah, okay, what you, yeah, sorry, I'm confused now, but uh, yeah. There is a way to, to set this up that makes sense, but it's a cosine for SL2Z, that's, that is definitely important. Uh, you can take a hyperbolic matrix in SL2. SL2Z, right? It's meant yeah. That is true. Yeah, maybe this is a typo. I'm sorry about that. Certainly what you can do is you can take something in SL2Z, it's a hyperbolic matrix, and trace it out in this thing. That's a well-defined quantity. So probably that's what I should have said. Yeah. OK. Anyway, sorry about that. So these co-cycles um, are precisely the types of things that we find analogs for, so piadic analogs. And they are precisely related to these kinds of intersection conditions that we get on H infinity. So these are the types of things that come up in their theory. OK, so this was the motivation uh, for us, really. That's what kicked off the construction. All right, so there's one important thing that I haven't told you yet, which is the notion of RM values of a rigid meromorphic co-cycle. Because now we know there are many rigid meromorphic co-cycles, but we don't know yet what their RM values are. So just to give you a clean statement, I'm going to make this auxiliary assumption, which is not really necessary. It's just to keep everything as simple as possible. And I'm going to assume that the modular curve x0 of p has genus 0. So in other words, P has to be one of these five primes listed there, 2, 3, 5, 7, or 13. What happens in this situation is, OK, what we can do now is, remember, we had these co-cycles attached to an RM point. We needed to choose a first RM point to make the co-cycle. And then we need to choose a second RM point to evaluate it. Right? So there's two choices necessary here. And we'll define this quantity JP tau 1 tau 2, which will be the co-cycle attached to tau 1 evaluated at tau 2. That's what this will be. So those quantities uh, we claim are arithmetically very rich quantities um, and should be thought of really as analogous to the quantity j infinity tau 1 tau 2, where tau 1 and tau 2 are now CM points. And that's defined just as the difference of the two singular moduli that you get in that case. So that's the quantity that was studied by Gross and Zagier in their paper on singular moduli. Okay. What's that? Oh, co-prime, that's again just for simplicity. Both of these are RM points, so they're solutions to some quadratic equation. And the discriminants of these two quadratic equations will assume for now are co-prime, just to make it a little bit simpler. Yeah. What about the abstraction that you said? Yeah, so that's a great question. So there's in general an obstruction, right? Now, in this case, because I've made this auxiliary assumption, that obstruction, because if I didn't say anything else, this would look like we get an, a, a value in CP, which is well defined up to CP times, which is not a very interesting quantity to look at. But the point is that under this assumption, you can show that this lifting obstruction of this pure theta tau 1 is in fact generated by the fundamental unit in the real quadratic field coming from that uh, tau 1, that choice of tau 1. Okay, so it's, it's a really small group. It's a really small lifting obstruction. And so in particular, everything I'm going to say from now on will make sense. Um, so this is the first conjecture. It's conjecture A. There's a more precise version, but I'll just give you the, the more imprecise and informal version. If we define HI to be the ring class field attached to tau i, we have two choices, right? So we have Q, and then we have um, K2 and K1, which are real quadratic fields. It's Q tau 1, and this is Q tau 2. These choices of RM points, they both come with a discriminant, and we take the ring class fields attached to those. OK. Now we can take the compositum of these two, and that gives us a big extension, H1, H2 over Q, which by this coprimality assumption, the Galois group of H1, H2 over Q will split as a direct product of two generalized dihedral groups. OK, so anyway. Um, 
the conjecture is, and this is the analog of what you would get for J infinity, that these numbers actually lie in the compositum of these two ring class fields. Okay? Of, of course, from CM theory for J infinity, this will be immediately uh, true. Uh, for us, it's just a conjecture in this generality that I've set it up. Moreover, if you change tau 1 and tau 2, but you fix the discriminants, you get a, a complete set of algebraic conjugates, okay? just like you would in CM theory. All right, okay, I can, of course, make conjectures all day long, but I have to give you some evidence that they're true. And so before I do that, uh, let me just make one remark. There's this more precise version, and if I would have stated that, you would have been able to see, it's a very elementary check, that, in fact, if you complex conjugate, which I'll call Frobenius infinity from now on, these invariants J, P, tau 1, tau 2, you just get the inverse. So they're automatically in the minus part for complex conjugation. Okay. That's an important feature that we'll see uh, later on. All right, so here is some experimental data to try and convince you that this conjecture might be true. And let's just take, we have to choose two RM points. For our first choice, we take the smallest possible thing we could take. We take the discriminant 5, okay, smallest positive discriminant. And we take the RM point, which is just a golden ratio, 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. Sure. Sorry, for what to make sense? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. So with this precise version, the complex conjugation will take a very particular form. And it'll be something very elementary in terms of tau 1 and tau 2 in these class groups. And you'll see just by the fact that we define them as explicit infinite products that there's a trivial cancellation. And you just get, that, uh, you get the inverse of previously defined things. But you're absolutely right, yeah. OK, so for our second choice of our endpoint, we're going to take something in the field Q joint square root of 2. And uh, I'll take a bunch of ones. It's, it's essentially, it's always the same field, but the discriminant gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So we expect to generate larger and larger uh, field extensions with these numbers. Now, here's one additional thing that we could do that Gross and Zagier couldn't do, because they always had the prime infinity. But we have a, effectively a, a new choice now. We can choose the prime also. We just have to make sure it's inert for both of these quadratic fields. So I'll add a different dimension to this table here, which is a choice of prime. And I'll uh, take the choices 11, 19, and 59. Okay, So the RM points are fixed. The prime is then also varying. Um, and so these are the numbers that we end up getting for these invariants. So maybe I'll give you a few seconds to look at these and see if you notice anything suspicious about them. So maybe a first observation is that it seems to be the case that sm smaller primes give richer invariants. They have more prime divisors. They seem to be of larger height. So that seems to be a, a general phenomenon, too. In fact, if the prime gets very, very large here, sometimes we get just one. Okay? That's a, from, the purpose, uh, from the point of view of generating extensions, that's, of course, very disappointing. But it's an important observation to make. Something slightly more subtle, which I'd like to point out, I don't know if anyone spotted it, but um, see, if you take the 11 adic invariant to the pair 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 and 3 square root of 2, you get this number. This denominator here is divisible by 19. Now, if you take the 19 adic invariant to the same pair of RM uh, points, you get divisible by 11. OK, well, let's see if that persists. Uh, oh, what about this one? The 11 adic invariant here is divisible by 59 in the denominator. The 59 adic invariant is divisible by 11. And so that's, again, maybe a lucky coincidence. So, oh, here we go. If you didn't believe me yet, now hopefully you'll believe me. The 11 adic invariant here is divisible by 19 squared. Here the 19 adic invariant is divisible by 11 squared. So there seems to be some reciprocity going on with this extra variable that we added to the story of the form that the ord p of the q adic invariant seems to be related to the ord q of the p adic invariant. Okay, so there's some additional reciprocity going on here. Is that numerical data? Or this is numerical. This entire table is numerical. Yeah. <coughs> All right, so what could be an explanation of that reciprocity? So that explanation is conjecture b, which will tell us something about the factorizations of these invariants. So again, we're in this situation where we have this compositum of the two ring class fields. And the Galois group of this compositum over Q splits as a product of two generalized dihedral groups, Galois H1 over Q and Galois H2 over Q. 
Now we're interested in a pair of primes P and Q. And so what we'll do is we take the quaternion algebra over Q that's ramified at P and Q. And associated to that is uh, a Shimura cav, which just arises as the quotient of H infinity by the units of norm one in maximal order. Now what we can do is to every element of the Galois group, we can attach a geodesic on this quotient, which roughly you should think of as just you take the geodesic between the two RM points uh, in H infinity, and you just take the image under this quotient map. Of course, you have to embed it in the group to do it properly, but that's the picture you should be having in your head. OK. So you choose an initial embedding. In, that's really what you should be doing in the quaternion algebra that we're considering. And then the choice of all the other embeddings becomes a torsor for the Galois group. And that's really what's going on. That's really what the map is um, in its proper definition. OK, so if we take the geodesic attached to some element, uh, and so we take an element G in the big group G. Big group G was the Galois group of the compositum over Q which decomposes into G1, G2 in these two different Galois groups. And we take the two geodesics attached to these two elements on this Shimura curve XPQ. Now you take the intersection product in homology of these two. That gives you some number, uh, some integer. And if you put them all together, you get an element in the group ring ZG. That's what we'll call IPQ. Now I lied a little bit. I said it's just the intersection in homology. There's a little bit, there's something that breaks the symmetry in that we have to put a, a weighting at Q. So, so far everything was symmetric in P and Q. Here we have to put a weighting at Q. So, symmetry is sometimes broken in this reciprocity law, but typically this doesn't come in, this weighting. Typically this is just the topological intersection product of geodesics. Now, the second thing that we'll do is we'll cook up from our invariance an element in the group ring. And this, this element in the group ring will just measure the ORD Qs of the different invariants that we got. So we choose, we fix a Q above Q in H1, H2, and then we just take the ORD Q with respect to that of these invariants where we range over all the elements in the group that we could have got. So we get two elements in the group ring. They're not entirely well defined because they depend on some choices, but they're well defined up to right multiplication by elements in the group. So we get well defined elements in ZG mod G, and the conjecture B is that they should be equal. So in other words, the factorizations of these invariants are prescribed by intersection numbers of geodesics on uh, Shimura curves in this case. That's what the conjecture really is saying in a more precise form. Yeah. Can I ask something about the definition? How do the coefficients depend on the element G? Sorry, so yeah, I didn't spell this out very explicitly, right? But G, I don't know if you can see this. Can you see this? OK. So we have the Galois group of H1, H2 over Q splits as the Galois group of H1 over Q times the Galois group of H2 over Q. So if we have an element G in here, in this decomposition, that'll give us a G1 comma G2. Each of these will give you a geodesic, and that's the intersection that you take of these two. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, yes. Sorry, did I define it? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's the same. Gamma GI, gamma tau GI. I, I'm passing here very freely. Exactly. It's just a torsor anyway, so it's not well defined, uh, only up to multiplication by G. So, yeah, I can pass freely. I'm getting some synthetic computers. So, this is a closed geodesic now? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. These are closed geodesics, absolutely, yeah. All right, so if we want to check this conjecture, we better verify it in some examples, at least. And so there's James Rickards, who is a student of Henri, who um, knows how to compute these intersection numbers of geodesics on, um, on Shimura curves. And I'd just like to point out that these two computations of these two elements in the group ring have absolutely nothing to do with each other. They're completely different computations. In particular, in the computations of James Ricketts, there's no static at all. This is just a classical question about intersection numbers of geodesics on Shimura curves. So we go to him and we ask him uh, for some data. And a couple of weeks later, he sends us uh, 600 pages of data, uh, which was really more than, than we were hoping for. Uh, so we verified it in as many as we could, and it was always on the nose correct. 
And to convince you, I'll just take the biggest one that we did, okay? Because then there's more numbers and hopefully it'll be more uh, convincing. <laughs> so here's the biggest one. So we already noted that the smaller the prime is, the richer these invariants seem to be. So let's take p equals two, smallest one. Now let's take for a first RM point, this point of discriminant 13, one plus square root of 13 over two, that has narrow class number one. Now for the second point, we take something of discriminant 621. That has narrow class number six, so we get six invariants in total, okay? Now, numerically, again, it seems that these uh, six points, or these seems six numbers, satisfy the following polynomial. So when you get this back, you think, okay, clearly this failed, this must be uh, garbage. It failed to recognize it, we didn't have enough precision, or there could be many things wrong with it. Uh, one suspicious thing about it is that it's a palindromic polynomial. Right? And this has to happen also, because if it's true that if we have one invariant and one of the other invariants is its complex conjugate, which is the inverse, these things must be palindromic. So this is indeed what we expect. Uh, still, that doesn't tell us really anything too convincing, but what is very convincing is that this polynomial generates the ring class field of conductor 621. So then you know it probably was recognized properly. So now we go to James Rickards and we ask him um, for some intersection numbers, some Shimura cards. Um, and before we do that, we take the constant term of that polynomial and we factor it. This is the factorization of that constant term, which already looks very appealing because it has lots of small, exciting looking prime factors. So then James Rickards computes the following fact. He tells us that the only Q for which some geodesic of discriminant 13 intersects some geodesic of discriminant 621 on the Shimura curve are ramified at 2 and Q are the following primes. And the intersection numbers properly added here for convenience are given by the following numbers. So if you see, those are exactly the same primes and the exponents are precisely given by the intersection numbers. So certainly to me, this looks very convincing uh, that conjecture B is true. Yes? And what happened to the prime two? Ah, very good question. So the prime two is not part of the actual conjecture, but the prime two is much easier to figure out. So if we're asking about the odd P of the p-adic invariant, we can just compute it. Because that, that only comes in in the first term and there's a very elementary expression for it, and that's the part you can actually prove about conjecture B. So the odd P is not predicted by it, but we can prove what it is and we have a closed form for it. So that's the least mysterious one. Okay, but well spotted, so yeah. Uh, so this constant term, it kind of, so, okay, I, the, the way I phrased the conjecture was slightly differently, but what I'm getting at here is really these primes that appear in the denominators of the invariants. So if you look at, yeah, so if you look at the, the minimal polynomial, it's kind of like the sums of the valuations that we've taken here. So we're looking at the slopes of the Newton polygon, uh, and that's what this, uh, these intersection numbers, again, properly added um, so that they come out precisely as conjecture B should predict. Okay, great. So in the last few minutes before I finish, I'd just like to return to this, this theme of, of analytic families of modular forms. Um, and if you recall, at the start of this talk, this is the same slide as we had before. We had this, um, this uh, singular modulus here of Weber, and we had these three properties that we wanted to retain. So first of all, it generated interesting abelian extensions. The second was it had interesting prime factorizations. And the third was this relation with analytic families of modular forms. So of course, so far, we've addressed uh, only the first two points of these. So conjectures A and B respectively say something about uh, the first and the second point in this list. So what about the third property? What is this uh, relation that we had classically? And can we find analogs of this? So before I tell you why, maybe it's not uh, outrageous to ask the question, why do we care about that? Why would we want this relation at all? And um, so of course, this connection that there was between these analytic uh, families of modular forms and these singular moduli has given rise to a lot of developments later on. And so notably, this plays a central role in the Kudla program, which seeks in more generality connections between certain algebraic cycles and coefficients of automorphic forms or families of such automorphic forms. So it starts with the work of gros Zagier uh, on singular moduli and has given rise to a lot of exciting developments in number theory. So it seems like an important question to ask also for these new invariants. So for real quadratic singular moduli, hopefully 
we have analogs of this, but of course we're in a piadic setting now. So there should be some nice piadic analogs of uh, statements in the Kudla program. And there are many instances already in the literature where such um, theorems are being proved. Now, one advantage that we have working at this finite place is that there's, additional there's this additional uh, connection that we can exploit to try and prove things in that piadic families of modular forms are very directly related to Galois deformations. And so that's an interesting injection of arithmetic information inside of this theory that uh, was much harder to get by in the complex story. So i first like to, well, um, in a few minutes maybe uh, recall quickly what this statement was exactly that Gross and Zagier proved in their paper from 1985. So what they did is they looked at differences of singular moduli. So tau 1 and tau 2 are CM points now, and J infinity is just a difference of the two singular moduli attached to that. It's an algebraic number in the compositum of the two ring class fields, and if we take the norm all the way down to Q, we get an integer. Okay? So they prove a factorization for it, but the way they prove that is they have two different proofs of it. One is algebraic, and uses CM elliptic curves. The other is entirely analytic. Since we don't have CM elliptic curves or RM elliptic curves, the second part seems most appealing to us. And let's see how that went. So what they did is they consider a certain Hilbert Eisenstein series, which arises again in this diagram. There's a biquadratic field generated by these two imaginary quadratic fields spanned by the two uh, CM points. And there's a third intermediate quadratic field here which is going to be real. That's a real quadratic field. Um, this bicoratic extension defines a genus character chi. And what they do is they look at an analytic family attached to this genus character chi over this field K3. That's where this Hilbert Eisenstein series will live. It has the following completely explicit expression, and it depends on this variable s. Okay. All right, so what do they do with this family? Well. The first thing they observe, and this is known as Hecke's sign error, is that when you specialize to s equals 0, this thing vanishes identically. Okay? So in particular, if you restrict to the diagonal, you get just 0. Now, the fact that this vanishes makes it interesting to look instead at the first order derivative. So we take this family at that point where it vanished, and we take its first derivative with respect to this variable s, and we evaluate that at s equals 0. Okay? This gives us some analytic modular form. Uh, and what they do is they show that the holomorphic projection of this thing, by just computing the holomorphic projection explicitly, is related really to these numbers, uh, which are the logarithms of the norms of the differences of singular moduli. So these integers show up there in this first order derivative. On the other hand, it's going to be this holomorphic projection, a way too modular form of level one. Well, there isn't anything in that space, so that tells them that this must vanish, and that gives them a relation. That gives them a relation between these uh, norms of the differences of singular moduli and other quantities that they can be explicit about, which turns into the particular factorization formula that they had. Okay. So for us, if we want analogs of this work of Gross and Zagier for these real quadratic singular moduli, already from the very beginning, we have to work slightly harder. Because we can't, what they did was very, um, I mean, they, they just took a norm all the way down to Q, which is a very crude operation somehow. If we do that, if we take the norm all the way down to Q, assuming uh, algebraicity, that should be the same as the product over all the classes of these two discriminants. If you do that, you could show, it's, it's a trivial cancellation, that you just get one. So if we take the norm down to Q, we just get one, so we don't get anything interesting out at all. So already, we, it seems like we don't want to be taking this uh, global norm, and we want to uh, refine it from the very outset. So to keep things, again, as simple as possible in these slides, what I'll do is I'll take a degenerate case. So in general, I take two RM points, but now I'll take this second RM point to just be a pair of cusps. So it's going to be a split torus. Um, so it's a degenerate case of what happens in general. And then we just extend the definition of what we had before by taking the co-cycle attached to the first genuine RM point and evaluating it at this, the generator of the stabilizer, which in this case will just be p, 1 over p on the diagonal. And that already turns out to be a constant. So that's the constant that we'll be interested in. And it's the degenerate version of the general uh, quantities that we just considered. So of course, if I take a degenerate case, it's maybe good to verify quickly that these are still interesting numbers. And here's one example that numerically we can compute that if you take the first RM point to be one of discriminant 321, which is class number 6, you take the seven-adic invariant attached to it and this split 
uh, Rm point, then you get a solution to that equation. So it's still interesting looking, and this thing actually generates the uh, ring class field of conductor 321. So it, it, Yeah, of zero infinity. So this is inside of the Sihara's group. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So you, you stabilize the pair here, zero and infinity both. Yeah. And this is essentially the only guy that does this. OK, so they're still interesting numbers, it seems. So maybe we can focus on this degenerate case for simplicity. So this is the setup that we have. Now what we do is we have to refine it. We, they took this genus character before. But we have to take some general character of the narrow class group of discriminant D and what we do is we consider the Piatic family this time of Hilbert Eisenstein series attached to that choice of character, which has the following Q expansion. So it's a Hilbert series, again, over K3, this third intermediate field here, but now attached to some more general character. Of course, that character has to be odd for this thing to be a holomorphic modular form. That's the only restriction. So a very explicit uh, Q expansion. And this is now a family of the weight variable K. K is the analog of S that we had before. All right, so what happens? We consider the diagonal restriction of this series. And we show that at the point k equals 1, so that's parallel weight 1, 1, if we restricted the diagonal, we get something of weight 2. Okay? What happens with this diagonal restriction now depends on the splitting behavior of this prime in this real quadratic field that we chose. For Gross and Zagier, they were always infinity and an imaginary quadratic field, so they were always in the second case. Okay? So they always got this identical vanishing. If P is split, you get a very appetizing looking formula also where the Fourier coefficients of this guy are given this time by uh, an intersection product in homology between the geodesic going between 0 and infinity on x naught of P, the two cusps of x naught of P, and then a geodesic attached to this choice of character psi, closed geodesic, on uh, x naught of P and its Hecker translate. So this generating series of intersection numbers gives you the general coefficients of this diagonal restriction, at least in the case where p is split. When p is inert, we get 0. So we get again that this thing vanishes identically, which is the exact analog of what Gross and Zagier considered. So it again becomes natural to consider the first order derivative of this analytic family with respect to the weight variable this time, specialized at k equals 1. So that gives us um, some form, which we can show is an overconvergent modular form of weight 2. And that overconvergent modular form of weight 2, we're going to take its ordinary projection to get a classical modular form of weight 2 and level gamma 0 of p. The analog of what Gross and Zagier observed, again, seems to be true in our case. But because we consider this more general character here, we get that this ordinary projection, again, we can show by direct calculation, has Fourier coefficients that are related to the logs of the norms of these invariants. But notice the difference here. We're taking a local norm, not a global norm. Okay, so this is much finer. It's just an index 2 thing um, and much finer than this global norm. Okay. Yeah, so they had s equals 0, but that corresponded also to a weight 2 form. Yeah. Okay. Great. So more, more precisely, what we do is we take this diagonal restriction at that point where it vanished. We take its ordinary projection. And we get the following expression for its Fourier coefficients. So we get our invariants suitably defined. I don't want to go into this thing too precisely. But uh, again, it's the same kind of principle where we take the co-cycle attached to this character. We hit it with Hecker operators Tn. And then we take um, the invariants or the Rm values at tau 2. We take their norms, local norms. And then we take their logs. And those are precisely the Fourier coefficients of that guy. So before, of course, this holomorphic projection in Gross and Zagier's case had to vanish because there were weight 2 level 1. There was nothing in that space, really. Of course, for us, weight 2 level gamma 0 of p, there could be some forms in there. And what we show is that, in fact, this form, which is a classical weight 2 level gamma 0 of p form, decomposes as the following spectral decomposition. It's an elementary multiple of the Eisenstein series of weight 2, which is essentially the derivative of the L value attached at that, uh, so the derivative of the L function attached to that choice of character at 0. So that's the point 1 minus k um, from before. That's the coefficient in front of the Eisenstein series. And then the coefficients in front of the cusp forms take the form of some elementary constant again, which is the algebraic part of the L value at 1 attached to that cusp form, times the logarithm of the norm of a Stark-Hegner point. So there again, 
these star Kegner points show up in the spectral decomposition. Okay, so we understand precisely how this decomposes into uh, eigenforms. Okay, so just to illustrate this fact where Galois deformations come into the picture, um, this is precisely the point at which we can do that. So th this quantity that showed up in front of the Eisenstein series, which was a derivative of the L value, that's something people have thought about uh, quite a bit. So notably the work of Darmondas, Gupta and Pollack uh, on the gross star conjecture shows that in fact this value is algebraic. It lies inside of the ring class field attached to uh, this choice of character, H, and it's in fact a P unit in there. That's, that's what they showed in uh, 2006. So in particular, uh, we get a proof of conjectures A and B in this case, because conjectures A and B before I phrased in the genus zero situation, so that's the case where there's only an Eisenstein series in that space. So the spectral decomposition just tells us that this diagonal restriction, which is related to our invariance, is a multiple of an Eisenstein series where that multiple lies in that field. And so it follows from that, that you get algebraicity, at least for the norm of <coughs> JP tau 1 tau 2 in this degenerate case uh, where we took one of the RM points to be split. Okay, so at least um, there's some theoretical evidence in that this is a proof of the conjectures in a degenerate case. So one thing that's undesirable is that norm, right? So th again, this is a local norm, but still we would like to not have that norm. And so I should point out that recent work of Dasgupta and Kagde, who, show, who use very different techniques, um, it follows using a short argument from their work that in fact this norm isn't necessary. You can prove that these quantities themselves are P units in these ring uh, class fields. So ongoing work with uh, Alice Pozzi also, uh, which is in progress, relates again these invariants without the norm to a very similar picture that I just had up before. But before I took a family of Hilbert Eisenstein series in parallel weight. And if you want to get rid of this norm, it seems that you should be looking at a family of Hilbert Eisenstein series, but in anti-parallel weight. So where we use a certain differential operator that gives us a family in weight two minus kk. And so if we restrict that to the diagonal, we get a constant family in weight two. And that seems to be where these invariants linger. Okay, so I've taken up quite a lot of time already. So to conclude, let me just say that I hope to have convinced you that it seems reasonable that this, this RM theory, these invariants that we had, we started off with motivating them by our desire to generate abelian extensions of real quadratic fields, but that seems to not really be the most interesting aspect of them anymore. They seem to have a rich uh, kind of piece of arithmetic encoded in them that seems worthwhile uh, to study further. And so hopefully in an emerging piatic kudla program, these invariants could play a role similar to the role played by singular moduli in the usual Kudla program. Of course, there's one huge disadvantage, and that's one of the things that makes proving these conjectures in their full generality uh, challenging, in that there's no notion of an RM elliptic curve. We don't have this geometric counterpart anymore that we did have classically, and that enabled us to easily show things like algebraicity in that case. But on the other hand, this is somewhat offset by the availability of the connection between piatic analytic families of modular forms and deformations of Galois representations. So with that said, I think the only thing uh, remaining is to thank you very much for the invitation, for having me, and for listening. So thanks.